But when she said anyone could do it 10 minutes a day, I thought to myself, that's the missing component. It's the daily commitment. It's the time that you say, this is when I'm going to do this. But here's the other thing, not just when and not just how I'm going to sit there and not just what I'm, I'm working on or writing, but why. Why am I doing this? In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back with actually a returning guest. I was looking it up actually yesterday because I knew we were going to be having this conversation, but he was on episode number 21 of the Rich Mind Podcast. I think we're just getting ready to cross over the 140 mark as far as episodes, which is super exciting. Super, yeah, I appreciate that. Super excited about that. But today I have on Dan Armstrong with us again. And so if we're not going to go through the normal part of the conversation that I usually have with guests that I have on for the first time with the questions and things, today I really want it to be conversational. We were just having a great conversation before we hit record. And it was like, okay, we've got to hit record and get this on record. So that way we can share the wisdom and things that, that Dan is all about. So Dan is out there. And the last time I had you on, you had to correct me. So it's Lancaster. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Lancaster. <laughs> Lancaster. And I was getting to see, I still got it wrong. Even I, I should have practiced more. I apologize. I wouldn't even worry about it. We know you're not from here. So, you know. <laughs> but Dan, if you're not familiar with Dan, Dan is a multiple best selling author. He's self published. He's gotten three books of his own published, but then he's also been co authors in three other books as well. We're definitely going to dive into. Uh, that conversation today. I really want to get into, I think it would be super valuable to have someone at his caliber of the ability to tell stories. He's a master storyteller, the ability to take the written word or even the verbal communication and paint pictures in people's minds. It just fascinates me and hopefully it'll fascinate you as well. So I'm just hoping to have him come on, share a lot of his wisdom, his newest book that just came out, The Chronicles of Elwick, The Temple of Wisdom and Truth which just that title alone is super fascinating. I have both the soft uh, cover copy here and I also have the hard copy or the hard cover copy here as well. I've got, yeah, dual, dual books, which I'm super excited about. We'll get into that as well as his, yeah, there you go. You've got a copy as well. So if you're watching this on video, you're seeing us with the, <laughs> with the copies. If not, yeah, we're super excited uh, to, uh, let me stop babbling. Dan, Come on the show. Let's let's talk to these folks and share some of this temple of wisdom and truth with the with the listeners today. Thanks for coming on this morning. Thank you for having me, Randy. It's always good to see your smiling face as well out there in uh, in Diana. Is that where you live in Diana? <laughs> in Diana, just like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yes, yeah, <laughs> somewhere out here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> oh, that's great. So yeah, always just appreciate you coming on. And as I mentioned before we hit record, I really just want this to be a just a really good conversation. I think that if sure. you could share with us, look, let's start in with just talking about the newest book, the the okay. Chronicles of Elwick, of where that came from, how. So I envision folks sitting down and thinking about, okay, I've got a book that I want, to, or I think I want to be an author. I think I want to do this, and I think I want to do that. But then they open up their computer and they just see the see the the blank screen right the blank screen with that cursor just blinking their eyeballs going what are you going to say yeah how in the world yeah do you unpack what's in your mind put it on a screen and then obviously get it into a physical copy like we're sharing with the folks today how does that even begin to happen i'm just curious uh well a a as you said this was my third book on my own so each one has been a totally different path one was a joy ride, and that was the first book. That was a joy ride because that was something that was just thrown together haphazardly. The second book took four years, and but this one took 25 evenings at three to four hours every night to write. And that is something that I am, I am, I'm lazy. So for me, to sit for three, four hours a night. I shouldn't say I'm lazy. I, it's hard for me to sit down 
but it's hard for me to concentrate for more than uh, too long. Uh, maybe I'm borderline HDAD or, or ACDC or. <laughs> <laughs> one of I, those things. One of those uh, <laughs> letter things. Uh, but I, dyslexia, one of those things. I, anyway, I was out in Texas at a Kyle Wilson inner circle meeting at his house. And Laura Patilio, who writes under two, uh, pen names was there and got to, well, actually I met her the year before. And then this May, uh, May of 2023, we had some time to sit down and talk. She had written, she had already written 65 books in the last five or six years. So I was just, you know, I had two books under my belt and I thought I was the bomb and I just fell to her feet and you know tell me a wise one and you have to give credit where credit is due when she opened her mouth i shut up and she's a lot younger a lot prettier than i am so she was easy to listen to and quite honestly you have to set the ego aside you have to punch holes in it so any you know any Anything in your ego just flows out and gets out of the way so you can receive the information and knowledge from someone who's been down a path that you want to go. So we spoke for a little while and she inspired me so much. One of the things she said was, anyone can write 10 minutes a day. And that was not difficult for me because I was, I was, accustomed to writing 30 minutes, 45 minutes every other day or or maybe once a week. But when she said anyone could do it 10 minutes a day, I thought to myself, that's the missing component. It's the daily commitment. It's the time that you say, this is when I'm going to do this. But here's the other thing, not just when and not just how I'm going to sit there and not just what I'm I'm working on or writing, but why? Why am I doing this? And one of the things that she answered was the why is to get these stories out of her head because she felt like they were important for people to to read and to hear. And I I was enamored by how structured she was in giving just what she does on a daily basis. I was taking copious notes. I mean, and and there's maybe eight or nine of us in the room while we were having this discussion. And I looked around and only one other person was writing things down. And that was Ron White, who's a USA or, a you know, two time USA memory champion. Of the, and he's over there writing notes and I'm the only one writing notes. And I'm thinking. This is gold. We, we've got gold in front of us and nobody's mining it. They're all just kind of like, whatever. I'm like, so she was a huge inspiration. So when I came home in uh, May and I, I don't know how I came across this idea of this sage who would be visited by this young boy who found this treasure, uh, this map in a treasure chest of the fabled temple of wisdom and truth. And it, it may have been a dream. It may have been just me. Uh, what do you call it, uh, daydreaming. But I sat down one night and I started to write. And I thought of Laura. What would she do after 10 minutes? Well, it's 8 o'clock at night. She'd probably keep writing. And I kept writing and writing. And all of a sudden, I looked at the clock and it was 11 o'clock. So I had written for three hours. And it was only about 1,500 words, which is not much. But I... But I, I, I sent it over to my wife and I said, hey, can you can you read this? Tell me what you think. And she's like, oh, OK. You know, so she looks it up on her computer and and she goes, whoa, where did this idea come from? I said, I don't know. So I couldn't wait till the next night. And I did it again. And the next night and I did it for sh straight 25 days, Monday through Sunday. 25 days straight. 
And sometimes even on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, I write a couple more hours. So I think in all, the book took about 30 hours to, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, what's that? 25 times three is 75 hours, maybe about 80 hours to actually write. But it was like a whirlwind. It was, it was like, I, my, my wife says I was in, I was uh, inspired by the spirit. Like I was moved so much that I couldn't stop. And it's true. I couldn't stop. Um, during the day I'd pick up a napkin, write an idea down. And, uh, but that's how that came about. Now, once you get it done, then you start, then you have to put it into production. And that is where uh the rubber meets the road yes the writing is obviously the first and and hardest part of getting you know a bestseller book out but where my where i struggle is the the editing the marketing the publishing you have to find a publisher uh even though you're independently published you do want a company to look at it to make sure it's going to meet the standards of the of the community, the standards of Amazon. Uh, and uh, so I was fortunate that I had uh, AR Publishing, American Real Publishing, uh, behind my back because they had got Smart Dust, my second book that I had written. That's this one right here. Uh, the audiobook was done, but it was, it was being held hostage by the publisher of this book. And uh, Roger Brooks, the, the, uh, the owner of AR Publishing got my book out on Audible within a week once I sent him the files. So I went back to that company and I said, I have a book called The Chronicles of Elwick, and I'd really like to get this out by Christmas. And this was probably September. And they said, hey, that's not a problem. Well, Randy and any authors or writers out there, if anyone says, that's not a problem. Don't believe them. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love this publishing group. I will be with them again. But it's just like when I renovated houses, I would think I'll just take that wall out, redo the wiring, move the plumbing, rebuild the wall, drywall it, and you know, trim it, paint it, and we're done. And that'll take a week. It'll be two weeks. So the book did not come out by Christmas. In fact, the artwork wasn't even done until mid-January. And there was just some glitches in, in communication in the sense of when they would get information and feedback, I knew it would be another week. I'm talking a lot, but you have any more questions? That maybe I've prompted some things in your mind, but it, writing a book and getting, getting it out there is... You know, people say, oh, I want to do that, but they don't. They dream a lot. People dream a lot, but they don't actually do it. So there, that's a good question right there. So why do you believe that that's the case? What was the difference between you having these ideas? Even Let's go back to the first book that you wrote, right? The, the Cable Guy book, um, the stories of the Cable Guy. I'm sorry, I'm not quite getting the, the adventures of a real life cable guy. Yeah, I was getting the title not correct, so I apologize for that. Okay. But then you wrote Smart Dust, right? Yeah. Uh what's what in your opinion, now that you I've obviously done it, but now you've been around other authors as well, between somebody that might have a fantastic idea in their mind, but they're not able and I'll let you kind of put fill in the gaps as far as like what is it that's that's keeping them them from that in your opinion? Or what can you, know, is there an encouragement that you can help somebody that's listening that has those ideas that they want to, but they're just not sure where to begin? I, you know, I, I used to train people in the cable industry and I used to, I used to use the model of, you know, this is, this is what we do. This is how we do it, but this is why we do it. And I could teach a guy what we're doing and how we're doing it within two weeks, uh, but until they understood the why, their work was subpar. Their work mm. was lackadaisical. Their work was really careless because they just were doing what and how. Until they understood, why am I being so careful when I drill this hole? Why am I being so careful when I measure the signal strength of this, you know, communication wire called coax, you know, through copper? 
Why is there an oscillating signal going this way and another oscillating signal coming back? Until they understood the why and the cross paths and all the, the myriad of information when it comes to communicating through a single wire, it, it, it meant nothing to them. So until they understood the why, then they had a meaning. So it, it means nothing to people when they, oh, I want to write a book. Why? Um, because I think I have a good story. Oh, okay. Why? Because I need to, because, oh, let me get this straight. Because you think it's easy to do, isn't it? No. The why will drive you when it's late at night and you're frustrated. The why will drive you when you set it aside. Because here, here's what happens. You'll start writing something. Uh, I, I'm going to take Smart Dust, for example. I started that in 2017, and it took me to 2021 to have it published. Because there were times when the why was not important. And that sat on the shelf for two, three months. I didn't touch it because I lost my why. Why am I doing this? Then I would read an article. I'd talk to a person. And it would spark this flame inside me. That's why I'm writing this. And then I couldn't stop. It was like it was such a deep, passionate pull that prompted me to to make this project really the most successful it ever could be within within my power. So if you lose your why, why am I doing this? Here, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing, and this this will help someone trying to write a book. Okay, I have a couple clients right now that I'm coaching. And I ask them to do this exercise, and that is I want you to take the concept of your book and put it in a 30-second or less or 10-second or less commercial. So someone would say, what's your book about? And you answer it. If you woke me up at 2 a.m. and said, what's Smart Dust about? I would say it's about nanotechnology being infused into a population without consent. Powerful. So if that's in my mind all the time, that's what I'm thinking, my why becomes stronger because now I want to back up my message. And the message of Smart Dust was, it's about nanotechnology being infused into a population without consent. And the person looks at me and goes, whoa, what's that mean? And that prompts me <laughs> yeah. to keep going. Does that help? No, it, it does. Yes. Okay. And I hope it does for the listeners as well. That's fantastic. So when you, so it's, you're, you're working with folks, right? You're, you're, uh, you have some clients. So another issue I feel like pop possibly, because I even have it sometimes myself is like perfectionism thinking that, like you said, the first draft needs to be the best draft when in terms, or in fact, it, and you tell me, this is where you're the expert. This is where I'm just assuming multiple drafts. I, so I was a co-author in a book as well. I was in part of one of the co-author books and there was, I want to say four or five separate different mm -hmm. iterations of the original form. So can you speak to the perfectionism piece? Like if someone's sitting there, but they're like, yeah, but it, it doesn't sound right, or it doesn't this, or it doesn't that, which is keeping them from, they'll put it on the shelf. And the why isn't bringing them back to getting it completed. I would assume that that, that idea that it has to be perfect right out the gate is maybe stopping them. Is, have you seen that with either people you're working with yeah, or even I, for yourself? I, I see both. There's a polarity. I, I see the, the polar opposites. I'll see someone write something and they think it is the bomb. It's a bestseller. It's, you know, no one's going to put this down. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, what are you nuts? You know, it's, it's, there's so many gaps in what you're trying to say. And then you have the other side that's like, oh, I, I have to wait. I have to make this perfect. And, and somewhere in the middle, again, <laughs> it comes down to ego. When you're looking for perfection, you're really operating off an ego platform that you think that you're, you kind of think that you're better than you are, and it has to be that way. And that's not true. And the other part of the ego is, uh, I don't know if that made sense. The other part of the ego is that you think you're so great that you don't need it to be edited. And this is the beautiful thing about editors, that they're going to hurt your feelings. No matter what, they're going to hurt your feelings. Get over it. Get some duck oil. Buy a big case of it and just start rubbing it all over you. So that when anything hits you, it just rolls right off. Uh, you know, uh, ducks have this oil when they can go underwater and come up, their feathers are dry right away because the water just 
trickles off. The same is true of constructive criticism. And it's not always criticism. It's just corrected. People are correcting you. This could be said better. Accept it. For those people who are perfectionists, just realize that uh, there, there's never been a book that I know of, except for the Bible, that when I read it, there's there's mistakes in it. I have looked, I've read the Bible and, and Holy Scriptures. You can't find mistakes in it because they are just there's somebody going over that with a fine tooth comb. But every single book I've ever picked up in my entire life, mine included, you, it goes through three, four edits. You get the book in your hands, you open up and go, what? How did that happen? In, in the Chronicles, there's there's uh, the word trees is spelled tress for some reason. There's one place. I Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but it, it's like, how did that happen? <laughs> My wife read it. I read it. An editor read it. A private editor read it. They sent me the book. I read it again, and I screwed up. So you know what? I don't care. I don't care. It's done. You know, it's published I, and out there now, right? It's yeah, and I don't care because mistakes are all around us. So that perfectionism is is really a hindrance to you getting your your passion. And, and, and the big why out, you know, your heart is bleeding for people to he hear your message. And that's something else about perfectionism. A lot of people think that they have to have a perfect message. But what people really want to see is your authenticity, your vulnerability, your real, your raw, and you're not trying to put on a mask because nobody's perfect. So for those people who think you have to be, it has to be perfect. Um, try really hard to just let that go. Just let it go. There's, there, you know, you know, I, when I when I was when I was dating my wife, and this pretty girl would walk by, and she'd go, "Oh, I bet you think she's pretty," and I'd say, "Yeah, but she probably has bad breath." You know, it's like <laughs> there's there's something wrong with that person, and there's something wrong with me. And there always will be. And I'm okay with that. Really. I'm okay with that. In my mind, Dan, there's nothing wrong with you, sir. <laughs> you have no idea. I can only imagine. Same here. So with that perfectionism piece, and that's kind of why I brought that up as well. I speak to people a lot about getting their message out there in the world, whether it's a written yeah. form, whether it's launching a podcast, like what we're doing right now today. Yeah. There's plenty of times that it's like, mm -hmm. it's a mess. It's a hot mess. <laughs> you just, yeah. you just keep moving forward. It's just part yep. of it. Right. Um, it just, yeah, that perfectionism piece. That's kind of why I brought that up. Cause I, I, I think about it a lot. I share it with people also, but I figured it would come into, uh, people would understand that a lot in terms of trying to sit down and write a book. So when you, when you're crafting a message and I've said this multiple times, and I truly believe this, Dan, you have the a great gift and the ability to share stories in the written form and also the verbal form. You're very good about sharing messages, but when you're, so let's just use the, the latest book, the Chronicles book of Elwick as the example, speaking still to that per, that person with the perfectionism with the, when you get the idea, how much of it did you have it crafted in those 25 days? Does that make sense? So how much of mm -hmm. the story did you have? in mind before you, you know, before you put pen to paper or before you put, you know, started typing words on the screen, did you yeah. have it? Did you have the, the entire story kind of mapped up in your mind or did you kind of just let it kind of evolve as you went through the process? Does that make sense? How I'm asking that question? I hope it does. Uh, totally. if not, please uh, correct and me. That's, that's how smart dust was written. I had no clue uh, that 650 pages uh, w would end the way it ended. I, in my mind, it ended a different way. And mm. uh, as I was writing it, these these characters were saying, no, I, I'd rather go this direction. Oh, yeah, would you? Yes, I would. Okay, you're in charge. So I, there, sometimes you develop a character who sits there or, or, or whispers to you as you're writing, uh, this isn't who I am. This is who I am. So I, I'm what's called, uh, I, I'm a, a gardener writing writer style. In other words, I plant a seed and I start writing and I allow the character like this is going to sound crazy, but it's just how it works for me. Uh, 
when I had Elwick go out to the forest to look at the trees that were ready for harvest for his father and had him sit down at this ancient oak tree and he put his feet against the tree and he put his heels against the dirt, pushed himself back. Do you see what I'm doing right now? I'm, I'm actually acting it out. This is what I do when I write. When someone when someone's gets up quickly, I get up quickly. And I want to know how it feels. Like, you know, the leather in the chair crackled as he released his pressure from, you know, you know what, what's that like? He stormed across the floor. I will get up and storm across the floor. And then guess what? Are you ready? I'll notice something in that action and come back to the laptop and start typing that, which I didn't know was there because I started acting it out. Does that make wow. sense? So it does. I start living in the story. And as I kind of move somewhere, I'll notice something out of the corner of my eye. And, hey, that could be integrated into the story to make this more powerful so that you feel like you're with me as I'm telling the story. Um, so there's a, there's a, a grandiose plan, but it's, it's like a movie being played out in front of me. So if when I, I'm I'm almost through the sequel of the Chronicles of Elwick, I have maybe about a couple thousand more words to write, and I have no idea where it's a collection of stories in the village of Havenbro Havenbrook. I have no idea what those stories are, but I know they're going to come to me because that's just how I'm a gardener. I'll plant a seed. And it'll grow in front of me. Now, there are other people that will map out the entire book. They know where it's going to end. They, were, they know the beginning. I get that. It's just not who I am. I'm a, I'm a different animal. And it's very frustrating because I can get stuck on a story for days because this stupid character won't tell me what he wants to do. <laughs> and I and can't. you don't move forward? Meaning you stop right there? You don't yeah. continue on with any oh, other yeah. part of it? No, I'll, I'll stop and just say, what do you want me to do? And hmm. yeah, it's my story. I'm in control. But if I force something, um, then the reader might feel that. Like, I, I feel like this was forced. Like, he made this happen. But if I allow it to happen, and, and I can't really explain some of this. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing process for me. I didn't know in the Chronicles of Elwick, that he would, re when he goes on the, the, the journey, he meets a hermit, and then he, he meets a giant. I didn't know he was going to run into them on his way back when he left them. I didn't know that. But as I went through the story, it made sense as he returns back as a, uh, as a sage, someone who's gained this wisdom from this temple of wisdom and truth, that he would have to run into these people to exemplify what he's learned and how he would apply the virtues he learned in this place. So it was important for those characters to make a reappearance, but I did not plan that. That's fascinating. I don't think I knew that. I don't think you've ever shared that with me. We talk a lot you know, about yeah. how your, your processes and things, but I don't think you've ever shared that with me, yeah. but your, the gold piece in there with, was acting it out in my mind. So it, as if, so as I mentioned, you have the ability with words to paint pictures in people's minds. I love listening to you share stories because your choice of words and your choice of emotions, but you do that in the written form as well. And that's fascinating. But to, for you to say literally, like you just literally sat up in your chair and it made a noise, but you're going to record that, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of, that's just, for me, my mind doesn't even go there. So that would be something for folks that are listening. Try that with their writing, right? If they're starting to, to, to with the process of trying to create some stories for themselves is, is yeah. act it out, act as yeah. if, right? Act, act it out while you're writing, get up. Um, I, I had uh, in Smart Dust, there's a, a two scenes uh, where this guy jumps in this, it's like a tube cylinder elevator and it goes down really fast to this um, underground factory where they produce this nanotechnology and so i left i went to a there's a hotel about 10 minutes from my house that has 12 stories so i parked my car i drove 
I walked into the hotel, walked past the uh, matri- or the the front desk, waved as if I was a guest. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the elevator. I pressed number eleven or twelve. I forget what it was, and went up. And people stopped and got in and went up. Anyway, when I hit the down button, I was very fortunate that nobody stopped me the whole way down. And I exaggerated the feeling in my chest of that dropping. And then I went home and I amplified that feeling while I was writing it, keeping in mind what it felt like to drop. And then I I put that into action. So I, there's so many times I will leave the desk and, you know, I'll, I'll take my shoes off and walk on the earth to feel the resonance. I will uh, feel the, the cold dew on my feet. Or I'll, I'll lay down on the, like in Elwick, he lays down in this glade of tall grass. Well, down at the end of my road, there's uh, five or six acres of woodland uh, right by this rushing, beautiful stream. And the water just gurgles. And, and and there's this, you know, you can hear the birds chirping. And I, I walk down there and there's an area, there's nobody around, but there is an area where the grass was about maybe a foot and a half. So I laid down in it and looked up at the sky and I saw this bird flying by. And that's where I got the idea for the raven in the Chronicles of Elwick while I was laying this tall grass, uh, maybe a couple hundred yards from my house. But the sensation of laying on the soft grass and how it hugged me and touched me and loved me, then I brought that back to the page. So I live out a lot of my writing before I write it so I can emotionalize it with words. And I've heard that from quite a few people when they read the adventures of a real-life cable guy and smart dust that they were moved. Um, Chronicles the same way. People are moved by the words. Uh, The reviews on Amazon for the Chronicles, someone wrote something like, um, uh, uh, there's... The way he writes the written word, I, I've never heard it put that way. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying that I'll, I think a lot of it comes to acting out what you're writing so you internalize it. So when you externalize it in your words, then it becomes internalized in you, the reader. So there's a, there's a real giving of myself, even though I may not be present physically. Love that. I love that. That was awesome. Appreciate you sharing that. Sure. So let's, let's pivot just a little bit. We've obviously talked about the Chronicles of Elwick a lot here. Can you give everybody kind of the Cliff Notes version, kind of a taste of the story itself? Let's, uh, yeah. let's share with them a little bit about the story. Uh, you've, you've talked about it a little bit here in the conversation so far, but can you give everybody a little bit of a taste of the story and kind of uh, what the meaning is and, and, yeah, let, let's talk about the book. It's, it's so cool. It, it's great. It's a great book. I was reading it yesterday in preparation of this conversation today. And, and you're right. Your ability, and I say it all the time, your ability to, to craft the written word, to create images and folks and emotions and folks is just, it's a fascinating thing. So yeah, I'm just, I would love for you to share a little bit of, of uh, the story itself. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, the story is, it's a young man. His name's Elwick. It's, it's uh, during a, uh, a medieval period. It's not really uh, nailed down what century during the Middle Ages, uh, but it is a medieval time period where the, this boy is sent out to the uh, woodland near near the village of Havenbrook. His father is a carpenter, and he sends him out to look to see if some of the trees are ready. He finds a a treasure chest that has the the the, the map to the fabled temple of wisdom and truth. He brings it back. He thinks he found gold, but he, he didn't. But there's much, it's much more valuable than gold. And that's the point that we search for treasures in the physical realm and we totally miss the emotional, the spiritual, the ethereal realm completely almost every day. You know, we're not aware of our presence in the world. We're just aware of, of this. We go about life like this. So he comes back to the village and and says and basically says to his father that he's going to look for this. And they 
the village people all come together. They're all happy for him, but they also know that he's probably going to die out there because, you know, there's nothing out there. It's a fable. And, but he, he travels and he meets two people, as I mentioned earlier, a hermit who tries to persuade him to go back home. And then he meets a giant who tries to kill his dream of finding this temple. So they're both these antagonists to the calling that he has. But he perseveres. He escapes both of them with, with uh, first knowledge and then with craftiness. He skirts them. He, he, he meets a third character who uh, is a homeless vagabond. He eventually comes into the temple and meets Magister, who is the sage of the temple. And it's a glorious place. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but he, he's there for a long time. But you don't know he's there a long time. So he does come back and he runs into these two characters again. But he realizes he treated them unfairly because now he is <clears throat> he's loaded with the practicing applications of virtues like honesty, integrity, care, hope, love, sincerity, uh, peace. All these virtues are now wrapped up in everything he does, and he refers to them often while he is thinking how to communicate with people. So he comes back to the village, and he sets up a school, and uh, it's called the Tower of, ha of Havenbrook, the Tower of Havenbrook. And then uh, in the sequel, it's, it's basically short stories of people who have come to learn from the sage of Havenbrook, which is now Elwick. And then there's a third book I'm working on, but uh, I haven't touched that one because Elwick has not told me why he's going to leave Havenbrook for this new journey. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. But it's yeah, coming. It'll you come. know that, yep. right? You've been through yeah. this experience so many times now. Yeah. You know it's coming. I know it's coming. Uh, the, and the audio book for the Chronicles of Elwick, Elwick is underway. And the first chapter is was published on Booksy and got quite a few reads and looks at that like 600 in the last like 12 15 days um but and repeat that again booksy if someone's booksy. not familiar com. with what that is booksy.com booksy? like, it's like a it's an author you site it's spelled uh b o o k s i e dot com just okay just spelled like yeah. it sounds okay I, you know i don't know if you can access the the audiobook it's just one chapter i put on there and the voice actor is unbelievable. He is British accent. It's perfect. Uh, for people who want to look me up on Facebook, they scroll back to March 3rd. They'll see the booksy.com link. Click on it. You can listen to the first chapter or read the first chapter, and it'll give you a taste of the Chronicles of Elwick. And I have, <laughs> even though I know what the story is, and I've heard the actor, I have listened to that chapter on Booksy.com probably a dozen times because I'm like, man, this guy's good. I love this guy. I was going to do gotta it. Be... I was going to do it. I had 11 Labs. Uh, 11 Labs is a, uh, a platform where you can re record your own voice. And then they clone it so you can use it for anything. And I got the file back. And I said, oh, no way. I want someone else to do this. I'll write it. You can read it. Let's keep it. That's going to be super cool. Let the ego get work. out of the way. I don't need the ego. That's super cool. That's awesome, Dan. So people have had a taste of now of the story. And let's uh, let's start bringing this one in for a landing. And let's uh, leave some people with maybe some inspiration, some some Dan Armstrong inspiration, trying to give people some some hope, right, of what they can do. Is there anything that's on your heart this morning that uh, you can share with anybody out there that is right on the edge of trying to put themselves out there? And whether it's a written form, whether it's jumping on a podcast like we are today, whether whatever their situation is, because it's all the similar feeling, feelings, 
and it's all possibly trying to keep them wrapped up um, in this unknowing of what the future possibly could be. Is there anything you could share with folks with try to give them some, uh, some encouragement moving forward? Uh, yeah, a couple of things come to mind and we didn't, this wasn't prompted from earlier. So uh, forgive me if I stutter. I think, okay, you know this, and I wrote about it in uh, Next Level Your Life. I, I or think big with you, I believe. I, I was born with a cloth palette. I still wear a steel uh, prosthesis so I can speak. If I didn't have it, I would not be speaking to you here, let alone in person. I just wouldn't. Uh, it's it's uh, it's something I've had to overcome. So saying that, we so often put other people's expectation, their expectations on us. We want to live up to their expectations. And when they expect that of us, they are being selfish. When someone wants you to live up to their expectations, they are being selfish. So I had to learn that though I was mocked and bullied and pushed around and made fun of, uh, and, then I, and, and still I'm not comfortable with my voice, I will not live up to the false expectation I have, what I think other people have of me. It, it, it haunts me. It bothers me. But I, th I think to myself, you know what? I don't care even this false idea in my mind. That's not true. I can, I can communicate well enough to get my, my point across. I'm better at writing than I am at speaking. But I can't let false expectations I put on myself or someone else's expectation on myself. I just have to be me. I'm going to be the best Dan Armstrong there will ever be in all of history, because I'm the only one with my DNA. I'm the only one with my faults and my fallacies and my triumphs and my tragedies and my passions and my pain. I'm the only one with the struggles and the strengths. I'm the only one. So therefore, I have to lay aside all these ideas of trying to measure up to somebody else their accomplishments, their achievements, and just say, what can I do with what I have from where I am to move forward? And then I can look back and say, you know what? I may not be where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. Now, one other thing I do, and I, I have them here on my desk, and I do this all the time. I have cards, all these cards, and there's there's probably about thirty of them here in the stack. And I don't do this every day, but I will pick these up and I will start reading through them, translate my confidence in doing magic tricks into what I want to achieve in business. That was from you, I think. I think you gave me that idea. The the uh, the confidence I have when I do street magic move that into another arena of my life i that's ironic because i didn't know that was the second one here i and that that was from you i i know that was from you um you know i i, I go through these to encourage myself I, I will find something and i'll say you know what that makes a lot of sense i like that and i'll write it down and i have a journal and i have all kinds of quotes in the journal but i like the cards because they're mobile See, the journal, I, I, it might be 30 pages, and I might have forgotten where I put that quote that I liked. But this, these I can carry with me. I can put these in my back pocket, uh, and then maybe if I have 15 minutes while I'm waiting for someone, I can pull them out. Your accomplishments are achieved mentally first. What do I wish to accomplish? Achieve it first in my mind, and then the result will follow. You know, others estimate us by what we are, not by what we say. I could go on and on. I and I read these quite often and and I add to it. So this is my second piece of advice is find a way to encourage yourself because 
nobody's coming to the rescue. No one, no one's going to come to your rescue. Uh, there are days you're going to be alone. I just, I just wrote an article last night called "Follow Your Dreams," and and part of it was, uh, you are going to cry alone when you're following your dreams, because not everybody is on the same page. Not everybody is in the same arena. There, are, there are mornings I wake up and I'm just, just depressed, and there are other days I'm just flying high and I'm laughing out loud and nobody's around because I say to myself, how did I become a best-selling author? This isn't, this isn't Dan. Yes, it is Dan. This is you. This is what you did. <clears throat> this is what you deserve, but it's because I planted seeds. And if you don't plant seeds, you're not going to get any crops. And if you don't nurture that, and this is nurturing right here, this is all nurturing. And uh, this is nurturing. You know, when you pick up these books on the shelf and you start reading the, the stories of other people who have gone from tragedies to triumphs, from struggles to strengths, from obstacles to overcoming, from, from pain to their passion. So that, that's two. I, I don't know if I have number three. I'm sure if I, I would if I'd clear my head a little bit. But, but for those people who are, are looking to, to pursue their dreams, um, just remember that you're not gonna you're not gonna achieve your dream overnight. It was Jim Rohn, one of my favorite all time public speakers and writers, who said, "You may not be able to change your destiny overnight, but you can change your direction. Your direction can change right now. You can change the direction right now." You can make a list and start following that list. You can just, just do one on the list today. Then do the second on the list. Write 10 minutes a day. Then you'll find it easier to write 15, then 30 minutes, then an hour. And now I'm in a habit where I spend two to three hours every night from 8 to 11, 9 to 11, sometimes 7 to 9, sitting right here. I might not be writing, but I am editing. I am reshaping ideas. I don't have the TV on. Uh, these are my golden hours. 8 to 11 is my golden hours. The, the house is quieter. Um, I don't have distractions. And uh, my phone is off. So anyway, it's been wonderful with you, Randy. I'm, I'm always, always fun to talk to you. And uh, I feel like I've been blabbering the whole time, though. <laughs> That's where it's fun for me with the stage to just open it up and yeah. let you share the wisdom that you have. That was, that was fantastic. So if folks out there are, you mentioned that you're, you helping some folks, right? With some clients and mm -hmm. obviously you've got the books available. Take a second and tell everybody where the best place is to connect with you, to find your books, all of that information as, as far as like when they want to connect with Dan Armstrong, where's the best place to do all that? Yeah. I have Dan Armstrong us. Uh, you might have to type, the HTTPS colon slash slash uh, <laughs> US. Uh, that's where I am. That's where my books are. That's where articles that have been published. The, the site just went live like six weeks ago. And on there, you'll have uh, interviews. I did an interview uh, with a guy in London. I did an interview with uh, Dr. Natalie Forrest in Germany. Rex Sykes on the LA Tribune. I've been on the LA Tribune a couple times talking about my books and just overcoming uh, from, you know, kid with a birth defect to writing uh, in best-selling books, but also just becoming one on my very own. Just amazing. Uh, but Dan Armstrong got US. The last tab is contact us. You could send me an email there uh, or you could go to Dan Armstrong author. Uh, at gmail.com, Dan Armstrong, author at gmail.com. The website has all my books on there and then links to buy them. Uh, yeah, and Smart Dust audiobook just, just hit a bestseller list uh, a week or so ago, which was great. So that was uh, number five best selling title I can claim. Uh, so yeah, it's been a ride, Randy. I, this is not what I expected. I just started to pursue my dream of writing and becoming a published author, never expecting that 
the title bestseller would be there. Uh, it, in all transparency, I did have a three by five card above my desk over my, my writing studio, which is in a, a small building outside. I did have one that said Dan Armstrong. And I, <laughs> I wrote this in November of 2021. I wrote Dan Armstrong, best selling author. And I put it up there and, and glanced at it, glanced at it. And, you know, the subconscious mind works in mysterious ways. And I truly believe that when you plant an idea enough, it will come true. You know, the, the Bible even says, whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. And Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret, a man becomes, or uh, as a man, oh, wait, wait. He, uh, I love that. I now I can't think of it, but it's the, the same concept. You become what you think about. We become what you become what you think about. Yep. yep. Marcus Aurelius uh, also said, a man becomes what he thinks about most of the day. So the more you dwell on your goal, the more you dwell on your why, the more your path will be open in front of you. And you'll look behind you and say, how did I get here? And you'll make it. You'll be there. You'll be there. Love it. Dan, I appreciate our friendship, man. We've gotten to know each other over the last two to three years, and I've seen yeah. you uh, really through this journey. And I just appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your wisdom, being a friend, and just being awesome. You're just really awesome. And uh, I just want to make sure you know that. And I put this out there in the world so that way it can never be taken away because it's absolutely true. I just true. I love you so much. So I love you too, man. So folks, appreciate that too. So folks, go out there, follow Dan. I, I couldn't wait to get him back on when he launched the book. It's just been within the last couple of months. We've been trying to work out our schedules, trying to find the best time to get together so that we, number one, we could talk about the book, but to have him share his wisdom of, of his process, right? Everybody's going to maybe have a little bit of a different process mm -hmm. and maybe his resonates with you. Maybe this is a way that you can take what he shared with you today and get started. It, and it's, it's the baby steps. You just need to get started and you absolutely can do it. I promise you that if Dan can do it and if yeah. I can do it and if anybody out there out there can do it, you can too. And we want to definitely be here to encourage you to do that as quickly as you possibly can. Hopefully today, maybe today's your day. So Dan, once again, appreciate you coming on. This has been a ton of fun. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get you back on again. Uh, Sometime soon, over the, the when the the sequel of the Elwood book comes out, maybe we'll do that again. How's that sound? No. Yeah, yeah. Please do. I look forward to it. So, folks, hopefully you found this message valuable. Go out there and share it with your friends and family. If uh, if you can help support the Rich Mind Podcast in any way, that would be the best way to do that, and I would greatly appreciate that. Go out there, follow Dan. Uh, he's uh, he did mention it, but Facebook is probably his most prevalent. Uh, social media platform. He's fantastic. He shares a lot of his stories even on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get more of Dan Armstrong, go out there and follow him on Facebook as well. But go out there, have a fantastic day, focus on being great. And I look forward to coming back with the next episode and interview very soon. Until then, bye now.